Good morning, good morning. Let's open with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord. Thank you so much for uh, this time. I think we are so privileged to be able to have your word available to research and to learn about you. And may it bless us to, and, and help us to see more and more about you. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. So Genesis 18, we may or may not finish the whole thing today. Uh, it's uh, So Abraham and Sarah are finally going to get uh, a, a, an actual date. They've been being, this promise of a, of a son has been mentioned by God quite a few times. And it's still not happening yet, but here we're going to see a promise that uh, is going to be made in person this time. So, but also an interesting story when it comes to uh, when we get into chapter 19. And so let's uh, get some verses up here. And I'll put a timeline up here because I thought it'd be kind of cool to look at the fact that here we are at Abraham. It's right about here. I don't know if you can see that cursor. I don't have my big cursor yet, which I will fix right now. <clears throat> so Abraham's right here. And I always find this fascinating <clears throat> when you see Isaac. Isaac is getting ready to be born. So we're right about right here. And look who is still alive. Shem is still alive. One of the original men that came with was on the Noah's Ark with uh, with uh, Noah, and so you can imagine that Shem, uh, that uh, Abraham, had direct knowledge of uh, somebody who was on the Ark, and so I just find that interesting that in this particular time frame, there wasn't a lot of uh, generational differences between uh, Adam going all the way back to Adam, even though it's been a couple of thousand years uh, to. Uh, to where we are right now at Abraham. So that's just my little uh, thing that I find fascinating. I don't know how much it really applies today, but uh, <clears throat> let's take a look at the verses. And <clears throat> I have the wrong ones open. Let me get the right ones open. Okay. <clears throat> so we'll go to this map. And the Lord appeared under him in the <clears throat> and the Lord appeared under him in the plains of Mir Mirmi. Yeah, I think that's on our map. Not on this map. Let me see. This one should have it on it, I think. striking out with some of this stuff. Plains of Miramie. It's right in the Sodom and Gomorrah, though, because <laughs> that's where these men are on their way to. So it's right in this general area right here somewhere. Because the, uh, the three gentlemen that are going to come visit him <coughs> are heading to Sodom. At least two of them are. So, and the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mary, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. He 
He lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them, and from the tent door, and bowed himself toward the ground. That was weird. Okay, I know what I did wrong. So we get here, uh, back to verse 1. And he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. So one of the more special appearances of Christ, he is accompanied by two angels, who we will see again in the city of Sodom in chapter 19. But Thrip, uh, Theopanes are pre-birth appearances of the second part of the Godhead, the Son, who became flesh, of course, we know, in, four, in either, somewhere between 2 and 4 B.C., and dwelt among us. And we see this over in John uh, 1, 1 and 1, 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. I'm jumping down to verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us as we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We can see by that verse there in verse 1 that in the beginning was the Word. The Word is Jesus Christ. So he's been around since the beginning of time as God. Remember, God is three parts, and that uh, and, and, the, and that the Son is part of that. So He's always existed. The only thing that happened in, in 2 BC is the fact that uh, He took on human flesh and dwelt among us uh, to be a perfect sacrifice for us for our sins. So that's what basically happened. Okay, verse two. We'll see it. We'll, we'll actually, we'll get a similar appearance in Genesis 26 2. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go now down into Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. This is talking about Isaac. Uh, and he's actually, in this case, he's told not to go down into uh, Egypt. <laughs> also, one of my favorite uh, encounters when it comes to uh, uh, Jesus, uh, pre incarnated Jesus is in Joshua 5. 13 through 15. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and beheld, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went up to him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? So as a good centurion, uh, century, uh, he was challenging somebody he didn't recognize. It's actually taught to this day in the military. And he said, Nay, but as the captain of the host of the Lord, I am now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship, and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? Now play close attention here. Normally, if you do this to an angel, the angel will come back and say, Do not stand up because I'm a, I'm a fellow servant just like you. So don't worship me. Worship God. But here he doesn't say that. And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoes from off thy foot. The place where thou stands is holy, and Joshua did so. So Joshua knew that this was actually a God, a Jesus Christ. I got a basic theory that God is everywhere at once, and that uh, he is spirit. So he doesn't have a physical form per se. Uh, he can manifest himself in a form, but that the Jesus Christ is his uh, fleshly form, so that's somebody that we can interact to on our level. That's that's just my take. I could be wrong, but I get uh, that's the impression I get from reading the Bible. And I also notice that uh, it seems like Abraham here in uh, so in, 18, in verse eighteen two, and he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood before him. And when he saw them, he ran to them to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. So Abraham sees the ring, immediately recognizes the Lord as he approaches, but probably similar, looks similar to their last meeting. Uh, remember, we, we, we saw them in the last chapter in, in Genesis 17, 1. And when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and he said to him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Uh, so that, uh, he probably still recognizes them as he walks up. Verse 3, And he said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. 
Let a little water, I pray ye, be fetched, and wash your feet, and arrest yourselves under the tree. It was quite, uh, that was a very big tradition back then, uh, foot washing. Uh, realize that, uh, that most people wore just open-toed, uh, open-type uh, shoes with a strap across it. And the ground is very, very dusty in that area. And that uh, they're walking all day long on these shoes. That typically, uh, usually it was one of the lowest lowest echelon servants would be would have that task. Is that whenever somebody came to the house, uh, that they, they would have the job of washing their feet. So it was therefore not only necessary for uh, uh, for uh, uh, motives of cleanliness that they would wash their feet, but also a very great refreshment in such a hot country to get the feet washed at the end of the day's journey. And this is the first thing that Abraham proposes. Going to Genesis 19, 2, just look at a few other instances. And he said, Behold now, my Lord, turn in, I pray ye, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and you shall raise up early, and go on your way. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. Uh, this is in chapter 19. We'll get to that. These are our, uh, other examples of places that this is done. Genesis 24, 32. And the man came into the house and he ungirded his camel and gave straw and provided for the camels and water to wash his feet and the men's feet that were with him. 1 Samuel 25, 41. And she arose and bowed herself on her face to the earth and said, Behold, let thine hand may be a servant to wash thy feet for the servants of my Lord. Luke 7, 44. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thy house, thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. That was an anointing that happened just prior to Jesus' death. Oh, actually, no, that was a sinner. Never mind, no, that wasn't that. That was a sinner who was repenting uh, with the Lord. Okay, and all the places in John 13, 5 through 15. This is the one that uh, Jesus himself actually does it. And after they poured water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then came he to Simon Peter, and Peter said unto him, Lord, does thou wash my feet? Like I said, this was a task usually of the lowest uh, echelon servant. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know later, hereafter. And Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet, Jesus. And Jesus answered, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. And Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. So now Peter's getting a little greedy. I want to take a bath. And Jesus said to him, He that is washes neither not, to, not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and you are clean, but not all. For he knew that he should betray him, therefore said he, You are not clean. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and, wa and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye not what I have done to you? You call me master and lord, and you say, well, so, for so I am. If then your lord and master have washed your feet, you so also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done unto you. So moving on, uh, back, back to Genesis 18.5. Just an example of washing feet. That, that was a, a very common uh, thing done in the Middle East. <coughs> Maybe still this day, I don't know. But continuing my, uh, in chapter five and chapter 18 here, Abram is getting ready to serve dinner to these young men. These men. And I will fix a morsel of bread and comfort you your hearts after you have after ye, ye come to your servant. And they said, so do as thou hast said. So they're accepting his invitation for, uh, to, to uh, spend the time and have a little dinner and talk. And Abraham hastened into the tent into Sarah and said, 
Make ready quick three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. And Agar ran unto the herd and fetched a calf tender and good and gave it unto the young man, and he, he hastened to dress it. And he took butter and milk and the, ca and the calf, which he had dressed, and set it before them, and he stood by, by them under the tree, and they did eat. And they said unto him, Where is Sarai thy wife? And he said, Beho Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door when she was behind them, behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. In other words, she had already got, got through menopause and uh, and and uh, wasn't able to get pregnant. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my lord, being old also? So he, uh, so she's, she's actually uh, joyous here to believe that she can maybe still have a child. Like I said, in that culture, it was really important for women to uh, to, prov to provide that for a, to build a family. Uh, and uh, and so the, the, this is quite, she thought she was going to go to her grave without producing any children. Just a verse on this over in Hebrews 11, 11. Through faith also Sarah herself receiving strength to conceive seed that was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang thee even of one and, ha and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. So in this case, uh, they're talking about the fact that uh, Abraham and uh, was pretty much close to death. Uh, he was 100 years old, and the fact that he was going to have a son uh, was quite an accomplishment. So I couldn't help but think of another honor bestowed by God. Uh, when you think about another old couple that uh, God blessed with a child, and that was Elizabeth and Zechariah. Then Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be, saying, I know not a man? And the angel answered, said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also the thing that the holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Uh, also Mary. Uh, thought I was reading I thought I was reading the account for Elizabeth. That was for Mary. And the fact that uh, uh, she too was uh, had a special situation where she was in impregnated without a man. So with God, anything is possible. And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which I am, am old? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee, according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And she said, Nay, but thou uh, didst laugh. Can't hide anything from the Lord. Some other examples of uh, hiding things from the Lord are in Psalms 44, 21. Shall not God search this out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. Proverbs 12, 19. The lip of truth shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. Mark 2, 8, and immediately when Jesus perceived his and his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said to them, why reason you these things in your heart? He sensed what they were thinking about. So Genesis, now on to, back to the uh, text, uh, chapter 18, verse 16. And the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on their way. So we see here that the two the two men are gone. We're going to see them again here in chapter 19. They're going to head off to Sodom. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Verse 17. Uh, and 
the verses that support this one. Over in Psalms 25, 14. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Amos 3, 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth this secret unto his servants, the prophets. John 15, 15. Henceforth I call you not servants, but a servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. And uh, James 2.23. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed to, unto him for righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. There's a beautiful title that I hope that uh, uh, we also can uh, feel comfortable uh, that we are also uh, in that category. So back to Genesis 18 and 18. Seeing that Abraham said, Surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. So a few verses on this over in Deuteronomy 4, uh, 9 and 10. Okay, take heed to thyself, and keep thy soul diligent, lest they forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them the, thy sons and thy sons' sons. Uh, what I'm basically talking about here is uh, he had a good command over his children. And I don't think that was in verse 18, was it? No, I was supposed to read verse 19 also. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of. Okay, now we can look at Deuteronomy 4, 9, and 10. Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligent, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest thou depart from the heart all the days of thy life. But teach them thus thy sons and thy sons' sons. Especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord, thy God in Herob, when the Lord saith unto him, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. So having a good command over the children. Also, Proverbs 6.20. I love this passage here. My son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thine heart and tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. When thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. And, of course, the classic verse over in Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. I can think, I think I am a product of that exact statement. Uh, I did go uh, kind of like uh, off the deep end for a bit, but the Lord brought me back because I remembered my roots uh, in, the, in the church. We see here God has determined that Abraham should know of the fate of Sodom. We know Lot lives there, and based on the exchange in the rest of the chapter, God will spare those who are righteous. Uh, so, you know, it sounds like there's a lot more to go in this uh, in this chapter. Uh, it's just a lot of reading. So I think we'll get through it okay. Right, we'll run, right, run a few minutes over. So I wonder if God would have spared Lot and his family if Abraham would not have uh, spoke on his behalf behalf. As we study chapter 19 and 20 of this, of this destruction, it's interesting that the angels can't do the deed until Lot and his family is removed. It speaks volume of how we should all should pray for our loved ones. Uh, I know I have family I'm concerned about. Let's, let's finish reading uh, this section here. Verse 19. For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he had spoken of. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come unto me. And if not, I will know. The men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom. 
But Abraham stood but yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? And Peregrine and So here I can see a, a, a good example of, uh, of uh, why we need to petition the Lord uh, for the things that uh, that we need, because a lot of times we don't. Uh, that uh, uh, without that petition, God may not fulfill it unless there's a request for it. And we see the same thing over in Ezekiel twenty-two thirty. And I saw for a, uh, for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. This is over in Ezekiel where uh, basically God was going to punish Israel uh, for not uh, doing what they're supposed to do when it came to a sabbatical of the land. Plus, they were doing a lot of idol worship and things of that nature. So if they had changed their ways and gone back, God may have changed his mind. Uh, but, uh, but because, but because uh, no man uh, actually requested it of God, he did not, uh, in other words, pray for it, that he... Uh, but I found none, so he didn't. Uh, he didn't go back on his word and continue to destroy the temple at that period of time. So these are they uh, who do intercede for their fellow man, even when they are our enemy. A uh, great example of this is over in Acts seven fifty-five through sixty. Let's take a look at that. But he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up steadfastly unto heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran unto me, him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witness laid down their clothes at the young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Saul there, by the way, is Paul, actually, before he become, uh, before he got converted. Uh, that was a, uh, uh, a great example of uh, the fact that because Stephen had interceded and had spoke the truth, uh, that the uh, that he was actually seeing God when he was uh, when he was being uh, stoned to death. That was over in First Timothy two one. I exhort thee therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. And so that uh, no matter what the situation, we should be making prayer and in our intercessions to God uh, for the things. In other words, standing in the gap, being ready to. Uh, do the hard stuff uh, that you know could get you killed. Okay, continuing Genesis eighteen twenty-four. So here, uh, here Abraham is actually going to petition the Lord and and, uh, and to try to get uh, the Lord to change his mind about what he's going to do to Sodom. So he goes through this back and forth, and I'm just going to read through this section because it's pretty much the same thing. He just keeps repeating and lowering the number. Preventure there be fifty righteous in the city, will thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So this is, and then this is going to be God's response. And the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the places for their sake. Continuing, verse 27. And Abraham answered and said, and Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Preventure, there shall lack f uh, 55 righteous. Well, thou, five of the 50 righteous, 
will then destroy all the city for lack of, of the five. He said, if I find there 45, I will not destroy it. And he spoke unto him uh, yet again and said, Preventure, there shall be 40 found there. And he said, I will do it. I will do it for the 40 sake. I think here in the back end, Jesus, Jesus uh, uh, or basically the pre-incarnated God, second member of the, of the covenant of the uh, Godhead, uh, is uh, already knows exactly what Abraham was going to say, but he's letting them play it out. That's why it sounds like he almost has the answer before the question is asked. And he said unto him, O Lord, let not the Lord be angry, and, uh, and I will speak. Uh, to uh, to be there found there, and he said, "I will not do it if I find thirty there." And he said, uh, "Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Preadventure unto the Lord. Preadventure shall there be twenty found there." He said, "I will not uh, destroy it for twenty sake." And he said, "Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet but this once." <laughs> Uh, pretty bold of Abraham. He keeps going back uh, at him for, for less and less people. Preventure 10 shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for 10's sake. So this place was so wicked that every single person was considered wicked. There are going to be five, uh, let's say eight people that are going to escape it. And, uh, and that would be Adam and his family. So at some point, uh, Adam's sons also... Uh, I think that's why he stopped at 10, because that would be Lot's family uh, that uh, Abraham was concerned about. So righteousness seems, uh, seems maybe even if the, there was a one, he would have spared them. Based on there being no Sodom today, we, we now besides Lot and his two daughters, there was no other uh, righteousness. I feel that uh, also why America is still protected from God's wrath, uh, which is why, which is way overdue. But for the Ameri Church of America, Church in America, I'm afraid would look like Sodom. Uh, basically, what I'm saying there is that if it weren't for us, for the active church in this country, I think we'd be we'd be in the same place that Sodom is now. <coughs> I think this heat is getting to me a little bit. I just, if I seem a little uh, out of it, uh, I'm just uh, a little bit more tired than usual this morning. But almost finished here. So he finished off the, and he said, I will not destroy it for 10 sake. So Let's just look at a couple of things uh, to add to this in Isaiah 1, 9. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Uh, this is talking about uh, in Isaiah, about another situation uh, where Isaiah is talking about same a similar situation. That uh, it, whatever it was, it had gotten so bad that it wasn't even a remnant left. Jeremiah 5, 1. Run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem and see now and know and seek in the broad places thereof. If you can find a man, if there be any that executes judgment, that seeketh the truth and I will pardon it. So I think God's always looking for that righteous soul that he wants to save. Uh, and he's willing to pardon it. But they're getting uh, in a lot of situations. They're just not looking to the Lord. Also in Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is that, uh, the gate, and broad is the way, that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Point uh, parable. And just to finish off this chapter, verse 33. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham, and Abraham returned unto his place. So, basically the deal is set. If there's any righteous, if there's a, at least ten righteous in the city, God will save the city. 
And so we're going to find out tomorrow that God doesn't save the city. But he does save Lot, his family. So we will talk about that tomorrow. And uh, I hope you have a great Monday. And we'll, uh, we'll see you all later. Uh, just to give a shout out to my regulars. Uh, let's see, uh, Quentin and Olivia, Teresa and Elizabeth and Nick. I uh, hope you enjoyed that lesson, and uh, we'll talk again tomorrow. Let's end with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you and praise you so much for all those that uh, look to you and look to you for uh, guidance and for education. And they continue to help us to learn more and more about you as we seek your uh, guidance. And that we uh, love you so much, and we give you all the praise and thanks. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, we'll talk to you again tomorrow.